I'm Batman. Easy, miss. I've got you. You... you've got me? Who's got you? Mr. McGee, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. I'm a doctor. But probably not the one you expect. I'm Captain Kirk. Welcome everyone to the Special Geek This Week presentation and this is the American Werewolf in London panel from Pensacon 2024 at the Wesley Abbey Theater in downtown Pensacola. Uh, this panel includes stars David Naughton, Griffin Dunn, and Michael Carter as they talk about the uh, making of the movie, being cast in the movie, and other uh, parts of the movie like makeup and such. Uh, David Naughton, who of course played the lead, David Kessler, the uh, American World Wolf in London, uh, Griffin Dunn, who played Jack Goodman, uh, his uh, buddy in the movie, who is killed by the first werewolf, and um, Michael Carter, who plays Gerard uh, Bringsby. So sit back and enjoy, and uh, also check out all the other great content on the Geek This Week YouTube channel, and enjoy the panel. of Animal House and the Blues Brothers, of course. Uh, so we knew, I knew when I was reading it that this was gonna get a lot of, you know, uh, attention. But, you know, it's, it's, it was a screenplay. Um, 
it was a very linear story. I thought it was, you know, had a lot of aspects. I mean, just like one line, David transforms into a werewolf. I wonder what that's about. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I found out pretty quickly because he was trying to cast this uh, so that he could send us over to Rick Baker's little shop and start the torture. <laughs> so yeah, but to answer your question, no, it was um, it was fun to read, uh, but um, you know, we'd be around 40, 43 years. Then. Yeah, uh, you know, when uh, when I met him, all we did was have a ten minute conversation. And it was in a line with a bunch of other actors, and he would just talk to back in for 10 minutes, and he wouldn't say what it was about. I said, what's it about? And he said, uh, never mind that. Are you claustrophobic? <laughs> and, uh, uh, no. Uh, I would have said yes, even if I was. But And he goes, OK, well, I, I need to know that. And so I thought it was a movie about a guy trapped in an elevator. Um, and But he meant. He was going to put us when we got to Rick's thing in a in a plaster cast with only two little holes to save our lives in a straw, <laughs> and we'd be left there till it dried. And it was it was actually pretty intense. Well, I'm not sure I actually read the script. <clears throat> and I don't know how to get one. I just turned up on trust because I knew with John Landis and uh, kind of vaguely described what might happen and uh, where I went. And he actually offered me. I got the offer of the part of the comic policeman, you know? Oh. I was going to play him, so I was going to play a comic cop, and I thought, well, that's good, that's great. And then I got a call saying they'd changed their mind. They never explained why. Maybe I wasn't funny enough. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, I ended up uh, running a marathon in Tottenham Court tube station at 4 o'clock in the morning, playing Joe Bridge. And it's one of, in a movie that's full of iconic scenes, it's really one of the iconic scenes from the film, Michael. It's, it, did, when you were filming that, did you ever even meet these guys or anything? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, 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 spent, we spent time in the back of the cinema. Ah, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's death. a good scene. But, ah. Yeah. But yeah, when Michael was on his own. Yeah. He was on his own. On his own. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you guys were out in the, I can only say probably miserable conditions, right? When you were out there filming on the moors and, and oh, that, how was that filming experience? Miserable, I think that was the thing. So, you know, and it's also, I was just gonna say for a minute, it's manufactured movie, you know? It's like we're in England, but John wants it raining, so we got rain machines, you know, out in the Windsor Park. And uh, these machines are just pouring rain and we're doing our hiking. Yeah, our first uh, uh, week of shooting was on, on the moors in Wales. And, uh, and I remember how cold it was. And uh, uh, before we started shooting, on the, we're about to do the first take, and of course it's very nervous. And uh, uh, I said, I, hold on, I'm sorry, I just, I just gotta take a quick beat. And I went to a trailer, and there were these little gypsy trailers. And I went in, and while I'm there, the trailer starts moving and it's attached to a pickup truck and it drives away from the set. <laughs> and I'm in there banging and I can't get the attention of the uh, pickup driver. And uh, finally, as it, you know, it's on its way back to London, I think. And uh, finally it gets intercepted and I put in the thing and brought back. Um, and John said, wow, we haven't even started shooting and we're already a day behind. Um, <laughs> And nobody was sort of kidding, but that was my first take. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the makeup because it was incredible. Although I imagine it was very difficult for you guys. Michael, yours wasn't as bad as everyone else's, really. You know, it was still a, a pretty grisly thing at this point. But but David, you you had the whole transformation scene, and Griffin just keeps falling apart the whole movie, which is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but you had a well. How was that transformation scene to film? Because it, it, on film, it's still one of the greatest uh, effect scenes in the history of film, as far as I'm concerned. Well, we we had the whole movie. We wrapped the entire film. We shot everything and just had that transformation to shoot. Uh, so that was the last, you know, part of the mountain to climb. You know, just when you think you sort of accomplished all the words have been said and all the scenes have been shot, but there was still this uh, transformation. Part, particularly because you know uh, Rick wanted as much time as he could get from John and the schedule 
to be ready for his stuff. And so that, that's why we had it you know, continually pushing him back and farther and farther. And it was the last thing we shot. Um, you know, from the beginning part of, of the initial uh, molds that were done, it wasn't such a bad deal. They went, okay, you're gonna put your arm in this vat and it's gonna dry. And then, you know, it was like, oh, that's kinda cool. Now we're gonna do your other arm. Hey, cool. Now we're doing your legs. Then it, when it came to my head, that's when it got real. You know, they said, we're gonna do your head probably about five or six times. And go, wow, that's a lot. He said, well, we need expressions as well for these molds that we're making. So I said, have you guys done this? And they go, yeah, once. <laughs> <laughs> once. Oh my God, out of that. And it was, yeah, it was, it wasn't anything you prepare for. It wasn't anything you could call because Rick was pretty, un, you know, unknown. There's no one I could call him. Hey, what's this Rick Baker like? You know, what's he going to do? He said, Oh, you're in for it. Well, I found him right away. And then, so the application of that makeup, you know, this that was at the beginning before we even shot doing all those molds. Now we get to England and it's the last, and the movie's all wrapped except for this scene, and. Now it's just tedious, you know, 10 hours a day to make up for five days to shoot, you know, the beginning. And we sort of went, you know, in order, you know, so the, the first part is looking at the hand, which is a you know, mechanical arm that Ricky designed and made and looked just like mine and it stretched. And, and, so, and all the subsequent makeup is just layers and layers of yak hair, yeah. <laughs> Good old yak here. <laughs> and Rick wanted his, you know, and John would be sort of impatient and come by and go, how are we doing? Get out of here. You know, it's going to be a few more hours. So when I thought I was close to being ready to go on set, he'd be the photo. We're not there yet. So it was all Rick's call. And, and days, day in and day out of that. Then we'd go out on set and shoot the minimal amount of time that was allowed for that particular portion of the makeup. And so John was very fast. He'd set up, he'd shoot, he says, we got it. And Rick would go, no, no, no way. I mean, that's two takes, and it's take me four months to make this. You know, he says, well, what else does it do? You know, depending on whatever the makeup he did. And uh, so they'd go back and forth on uh, Rick trying to get additional angles to shoot, and John knew what he wanted. He says, I got what we need, let's go, we'll take it off, come back tomorrow. <laughs> that's how that went. And Rick, you, you were just falling apart. So we went on. How I, was that? Well, I, I um, you know, I, when we did the first test, first we were, we were flown to LA, um, and we're in Rick's studio, and he applied the first, um, uh, the first makeup, which was immediately after um, I was attacked by the werewolf, and it took a great deal of time. Um, but as it, uh, watching in the mirror what he's doing, and it just becomes more and more real. It becomes so graphic, so detailed, this little vein that's like wiggles. And I have to tell you, it was really kind of disturbing to see what I would, it looked like exactly what I would look like if I was mauled to death, you know? I kind of had a moment of being a little freaked out about it thinking about my mother having to look at this, you know. Um, but it was, it took a long time uh, uh, to put on and a very long time to take off because they were all these, app, um, it needed spear gum to, you know, get it to, to finally come off and they were in pieces. Um, so when everyone was wrapped, I, Rick and I would stay behind and it would take, a, you know, an hour or two to just take it off. Um, but the final one, uh, wasn't me, that was actually a puppet, uh, which I was very threatened by. Um, <laughs> and I kind of, uh, you know, insisted, well, at least let me, you know, control it and, while I'm talking, um, which they did. And uh, we were all in the theater, and so I'm moving the mouth and the hands, it was incredibly fun, and, and, and playing the part looking at a monitor. It was like being a Muppet or something, you know? Um, it was very Jim Henson like, so. And, and Michael, you of course did do some serious makeup in start in the Return of the Jedi when you were with Fortuna. So how was this experience compared to that? Uh, well, the, the, I mean, it was quite light. I mean, it was kind of only came, that came before, just the throat ripped off, the face hacked, 
so um, that was okay. Generally, it was uh, pretty monstrous. That was uh, about eight and a half hours. <coughs> and I couldn't see a thing. I kept walking into people, walking into stands. <laughs> <clears throat> because the, the haptic lenses are, you know, completely opaque. So I did that performance virtually blind. Um, but I remember, I mean, my mother was in America when the film came out. My mother's a very, she was a very kind of old, correct Scottish woman, you know, very Presbyterian. And um, my brother, uh, when she was visiting, took her to see the film. And it's not the kind of film I would have taken my mother to see, <laughs> uh, primarily because there's a bit of sex in it, you see, and I'm very horrified. And she was pulled by Jenny Agatha, she said she didn't know what she was doing. But the only thing she said about the, the film was she said to me, she said, you look very smart in your suit. <laughs> <laughs> your coat and the tube, it was a shame the werewolf had to rip it all apart. <laughs> what about the film? Oh, I couldn't understand it. <laughs> Michael, what were you acting to when you were filming that scene where it was, did they have somebody up there to give you eye lines or what were they doing? Well, down in the tube? Yes. No, it was just all done. I mean, John would stick his hand up mm -hmm. and he'd say, There's a shot now. And I'd just sort of react. Um, that's, that's all we you know. it's, it's a brilliant performance because we never see the werewolf until that very last shot, and then you just see him appear, and then that's it. Which yeah. was very smart, um, and smart filmmaking by John Landis to not show you the whole thing until the right moment, and then it was that much more shocking. Um, so I want to ask one more question, and I want you guys. So if anybody has any questions, you can line up here at the microphone, and we'll we'll take those. But um, Joe Dante is here this weekend. Did you guys know about the howling at the time you were filming American Werewolf? Because it seemed like there was a bit of studio wrangling to try to get that movie out before American Werewolf. And did you were you aware of any of that? I wasn't. You know, we were immersed in London. You know, living in there and shooting this film. You know, far from the studios and so I was not aware of it and, you know and, and I don't even know um, I mean there was some backstory where Rick supposedly you know was over there on you know with Rob Bottin, um and you know when John Landis and John and Rick go go back you know they started with little movies like Schlock <coughs> so uh, you know it's I'm sure Rick had stories about it, you know, what was going on with the Howling. And John knew about it being there. But it wasn't, you know, we just knew we were almost done. Uh, I mean, really from start to finish, if you can imagine, when I met on I met John in October of 1980, got the job, we started the preliminary makeup. We shoot it this time of year, February and March in London, and it comes out in August of 81. So, you know, that's really a short start to finish production. Period from you know literally casting to release. Well, you guys, yeah, yeah, it was it was crazy because you know I've read several books and they talked about that right away that, that Joe and, and of course the makeup effects stuff was the big thing because they were trying to get Rick on that film. And, yes, and of course Rob Bottin stepped up and did some amazing work on the Howling too, so it all yeah. worked out. Um, did you guys, had you ever met before in the movie? Had, had any of you? I mean, because David and Griffin, you both have such great chemistry on screen as the two the two hikers there. So did you, had you known each other at all? No, we, we never met. I, I, I think we met before shooting, I don't know if you remember this, in a parking lot. Um, I so, think yeah. we went to, uh, uh, you were with your manager, I think we went to the same movie without knowing it, some screening, and uh, it's like, oh, wow, hey, nice to meet you. See you in London. <laughs> yeah. No, we didn't know. But I think we had quite some family in Connecticut, mm -hmm. you know, where I grew up. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we, and you know, when you're there, we're the only Americans working on it. And the other, you know, work permits were for John and Rick and us. And I think that was about it. For, you know, British equity is very hard to get permission to shoot. And, and in, in fact, I don't know if it really happened, but they were talking about scouting other locations in France and places. Should we not get permission to shoot this movie, which is completely filled? Everybody who works on the film, top to bottom, are British. You know? But so we couldn't imagine that we have refusals. But they did insist that they they hold auditions. Can you imagine? We're like three, four months into the production, all the moldings have been done, the makeup's been done, but they had to have a casting call for our parts, which was part of the stipulation. 
they would, you know, and I've been to some of those auditions. Yeah, well, you, you know, know the part. part's not available, but you're in your audition. <laughs> That's not a problem for, for our position. Well, do we have any questions out there? Anybody want to step up to the mic? I see someone coming. Here we go. David, you're like naked for a lot of the movies. <laughs> what? You're naked for a lot of the movies. Did you say naked? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> What's it like to be rolling through the streets of London and see you, you know, very naked in a movie? Pretty good makeup, though, huh? Was that, <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> was that a yes or no? Yes, I was. <laughs> and don't knock it until you try. Subsequently, I don't even look for scripts with naked scenes. <laughs> No, it's, you know, you look, what, what I would do, you know, like knowing when you read this, you know, what are the sensitive scenes that, you know, give you, give you uh, some, if not trepidation, at least some interest in looking at the schedule. So when the schedule comes out, that's the first stuff I turn to and say, all right, when's the love scene? You know, um, now, when, you know, when's the naked scene? Well, naked stuff starts pretty soon, you know, pretty soon, and, 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 um, you know, but it's like the love scenes. I, I would say, and Griffin's directed it, you might, you know, agree with this, is get the love scene out of the way early, you know, as soon as you can in the, in the production, because you never know how these actors are going to get along. And the longer you wait, the longer, the better, the greater the chances are of things somehow going wrong or having some sort of resentment or vendetta. So when it comes time to love scene, it's like, I don't want to work with that song. So you, you want to get it done early because everybody's petrified and you know, nobody's you know, excited about the thing except for the crew, of course. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. But, but in, a movie, in a movie like this, getting to have a love scene with Jenny Agnew is pretty good. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was. What a, what a, what a yeah, beautiful I mean, and talented. Very talented. She's a good sport. You know, she's the only gal in this movie. We're all like, yeah, we're doing this werewolf movie, and so she had her hands full with us. But um, you know, as far as the naked stuff goes, you know, you, I would sort of get in. You know, you're, I'm in this space when we're on the set, or they're getting ready to roll, and I'm sitting, you know, with like, you know, slippers on and a blanket, and, and a, you know, guy goes, I'm sorry about this, Mr. Malone. You know, it's all right. On action, take the blanket. You know, and. Uh, but once you're in the scene, that's the scene. That's what it's called for in that scene. So there isn't really a whole lot of self-consciousness going. It's when they cut. Now you're a naked guy standing out in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the guy with the blind? Oh, here he's coming. Here he goes. <laughs> there would be those things in the zoo, for example. We're you know there's a whole scene in the zoo where I wake up, of course, which is a whole other story in the wolf cage, but. The um, where I steal the lady's coat, you know, and I, I'm streaking, grab it, and I run. I remember going to, before we take it. I go, why? Why do we have all those extras over there? And they go, oh, those aren't extras. The zoo's open. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what, what happened? Oh, you can overstay your length of time with the allotment, two hours, or something. and then if you get to stay there and you get it, they're, they're not going to wait and hold, you know, hold the. Oh, so in they walked, going about their, you know, duties, and there we were in another you are new exhibit today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little girl with a balloon hat, man. It was like a little boy. A little boy, yeah. He was now 50 years old. Oh, <laughs> no, yeah, that's all part, it's all written in the script. Yeah. There's a lady that they have, who was just, a, you know, atmosphere, an extra for the day, who is, she's sort of um, prominently displayed. When I come out from behind a bush and I run into her and I go, excuse me, and I, and I leave. They didn't tell her what was going to come from behind the bush. <laughs> so this is, you know, safe, you'll be fine, but this guy's going to come out from behind there and he's just going to say something and leave. And you just sort of look at him and go, oh, all right. <laughs> well, one take and she was mortified. <laughs> Okay, so I was 19 when the movie came out, but with the mind of a 13 or 14 year old, the scene that Just like us! <laughs> <laughs> the 
the scene in the theater where Michael and the other victims are trying to you know, convince you not, and uh, Griffin's in there talking to you. I don't know why, but I was glad. I had tears in my eyes. The little flap of skin that's on, Gr the, on Griffin, every time he spoke, it was just sitting there, just a flap. Every time he spoke. And I, was that on purpose, or was that just? I'm sure Rick had that in mind. It was actually what that little thing was. It was, I don't know why, it was hilarious. Credit for it, yeah. But that's one of the best written scenes, too, I think. Yes. Where they're all talking and you know, coming up with ways to uh, kill, kill myself. That's, you know, so there's that. And there are ways you walk that line a lot in the film, being funny but playing it dead straight and realizing just how absurd it is. And even Which did. was very original at the time. I mean, I mean you got criticized for. How dare you mix humor with? Right. Yeah. You know, no, of course. I mean, well, and you still was a friend at the end. I mean, literally, you know, you were still trying to, you know, say everything's going to be okay. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Uh, don't take this the wrong way when I say this, but uh, when you were putting all that makeup on, there was an like a moment. Either one of you two is like uh, in the middle of this. Uh, I gotta go take a crap or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> I'm begging your pardon. <laughs> no, um, just you know, yeah, we had, there was also a photographer, you know, a still photographer who was on the set, taking, you know, stills, production stills, all the time, Bob Willoughby, you know, Bob. Oh, yeah. and he was a well-known life magazine photographer, so he was <coughs> relentless, you know, particularly when, uh, during the transformation. <coughs> I mean, the first makeup, part of the makeup, I would do this with my hands. Rick would do the big paws and start layering. So you can't really use your hands for anything, particularly eating lunch, you know, and so on. So if we wander, say, hey, I need a break, I'm going to walk in, try to wander down to the restroom, Bob would be there. Bob, come on. In other words, hold it. Yeah, Bob, Bob, you know. Yeah, so we were sensitive. So most people were pretty sensitive to it. The crew was relentless with me. They go, kind of a cold day today, isn't it, day? <laughs> Of doing whatever it is you wanted to do, you know, the film comes along, the movie comes, 
the song comes along. You know, it was so difficult to be considered for those different things where you had to make a choice. Are you a TV guy, are you a film guy? You know, and make those choices for yourself, which are unfair, and, and you can see over the years it's changed. You see people doing multimedia throughout. Well, I definitely had to make this choice. <laughs> yeah, so I was, but I always had, you know, fond memories. We had, we did a lot of commercials with a lot of talented dancers, all of whom were, you know, trained, and then it was me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can see how we can do that. We had a great choreographer, you know, that sort of stuff. And, and uh, <clears throat> are you guys still in contact with the cast of Speed Next Day? Yeah. Speed Next Day, yeah. Well, that's it. You're good loving. When you were rehearsing for Free Walker, did you have much in front of the For Dre? No. I don't believe it. Whenever you did one, I'll call it the same show. Oh, it must have been in that, yeah. Okay. We had some famous folks, who exception to this gentleman is approaching. Yes. <laughs> I was waiting for, for that. Yeah. Um, I have an argument a lot with some of my friends on whether American Werewolf is a comedy or a horror movie. I've always said it's a horror movie with funny bits. I was just wondering what your opinion on that is. I, I would agree with you, but um, you know, as I said, that I'd never come across, most people didn't come across a horror movie, particularly one as vividly violent as this, and then have a joke. And then, and have characters just come from, be covered in blood and making jokes in a movie theater. Um, it, it was very unique at the time. Um, but, but I don't know, I, I think it's probably in the horror genre. Oh yeah, I think, you know, Landis talks about the, the marketing campaign, saying you know, from the director of Animal House, a different kind of animal. He, well, he was trying to make people realize this isn't Kentucky Fried Movie. You know? We're not going to set do a spoof in any kind. Um, and it freaked a lot of people out. I and mean, over the years, I've met a lot of fans who say we couldn't stay. You know, how far did you get? As soon as you got attacked, Griffin was attacked, and then we had to leave. Did you ever see it? Yeah, well, we've seen it since, but they left the theater. I don't know if you've ever, uh, if there are those of you who haven't seen it on a big screen, if you ever get a chance, please do, because that was what it was intended to do, to be seen on a big screen. And, um, and Landis always would say, more blood, but he'd also say, this is a horror film, which he wrote when he was 21. I more blood, more blood. I just think it was such a revolutionary film, in a sense. It's so shocking, just because the special effects were so brilliant. I mean, you know, we're kind of used to horror films, so see something spinning on a length of string. Um, that was what was amazing. I mean, I was quite amazed when I saw it. It was true. Well, the, and the tonal shifts in the movie are what I really love. I like, you know, especially like your dream sequence. It, it, it comes out of nowhere, really. And it just, and it's this beautiful, you know, <coughs> everybody's happy, everything. And then Nazi monsters bursting through the door and, and, and you kind of seeing this vision of yourself in the dream. And I, I just think that's really great. And I think that's something that's become much more mainstream now that that happens in movies. But, and before it did not. Yeah, and I think also just the ploy of having a dream within a dream, you know, that happens. And it's been, you know, borrowed, I should say, <coughs> copied uh, for years. But it's, I, I couldn't ever see one before <coughs> that, you know, film of where a guy wakes up and he realizes he's in a dream. And they get that double scare. That was a big one. I remember just sitting in the back of, in New York, being in the back of the theater, watching audiences literally leave their seats. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you see people literally jump out of their seats, but it's kind of fun from behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is gonna get them. <coughs> All right. I'm a little late to the party, so you might have already answered this, but the, the porn film in the film was that an actual porn film, or was that something that Landis had done? Isn't that what we originally auditioned for? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, that was the first day of shooting, and a number of the crew were going to quit because you see, you know, John cast those parts, and that script he wrote, which is ridiculous if you listen to the 
you know, the teacher said, oh, I don't know you, you know, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I mean, it's so silly. Uh, and so, but it was the first day of shooting, and so they were ready to bolt, going, I don't know what this movie is, this guy's lost his way. <laughs> we like Animal House, but this is, uh, and so he said, no, no, stay, I'm just going to be playing with your thing. So they, they hung around, but uh, it's okay. all made to me. Okay, so I can't find it. <laughs> and I remember them showing up at the rap party. Remember? That's <laughs> how you were What are we you? Oh, we were in the porn film. <laughs> of course. I have that figure. Yes. So, what, were you, what was your reaction when you first saw the film? After all of this that you had endured and all that, were you like, wow? Or were you just blown away? Or were you like, oh. I first saw it by myself at a screen. I don't know if you used to have a screen. Yeah, which is not the way you want to see a movie like this, you know, sitting in. But seeing it finished, hearing the soundtrack, you know, realizing, oh, wow, this is music, music was pretty, pretty special. And seeing um, really what we shot is up on the screen. You know, there isn't a lot of, of there weren't a lot of deleted scenes. There weren't Takes that John didn't do a ton of takes, you know, he was fast and it's all up there. Um, so, yeah, I saw it um, also by myself. They wanted us to see it before uh, we promoted it, and there was a, a word I'd never heard of called a junket that, uh, and it was, they, it was in a hotel in New York, very, very grand hotel. Um, and I thought it was just like an interview. So I sat down, one person comes in, and then I find out that it's, you know, 60, 70 people asking pretty much the same questions over and over. Um, and it was, it was really, I, I, I'd never done anything like that. Um, but, but it was, uh, and I was staying in the hotel rather than go downtown to the, uh, the East Village. And after the junket was over, I just stayed on at the hotel. Um, for about a week until Universal noticed. Uh, and I just ordered room service and uh, ran up a huge bill that I never had to pay. Michael, when did you first see it? I saw it at the premiere in London. Um, and was, I hadn't read the entire script because I'd been given the entire script. And I was sitting between two quite large female casting directors who did that thing you were talking about. You know, so, Woo! <laughs> and the whole audience was kind of berserk. I mean, the thing went down the store. It really did. And, yeah, I mean, there, there were just about a thousand people there. You hear this? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic. You know, and I just kind of sat there, smothered by these two casting directors, <laughs> insisted in gripping me every time they got scared. <laughs> I worked with them again. <laughs> And how quickly, because Griffin, you said like you hadn't done much before this film. How, how quickly did it change your life? Because David was already out there. We knew David from the Dr. Pepper commercials. He'd already had a hit song. He had a sitcom. He was doing all of this different stuff and, and, and it was kind of going on. But like, did it change your life? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, uh, I, I, I got a, like a lot of mail from a lot of girls. Um, <laughs> then I answered every one. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, being recognized, all that kind of stuff. But I have photos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and David, I mean, because it was a sh it, obviously when we talked about tone shift in the movie, that was a tone shift for you, and you kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but did it open up different doors for you? Well, I, you know, <clears throat> was not interested in doing makeup, you know, <clears throat> and there was always the lesser films, you know, the horror films or other things that come in and that there's makeup involved. You know, I was, I used to just stop it right there, you know. This is gonna be like a 10 year decompression from this experience, to, to want to go jump right back in. I say that looking back, you know, but that was really the case. I was not interested in doing more special makeup. You know, I work, worked with Rick and he won the Academy Award the next year. The first of his, I think he has seven now. And he's since retired. But if you got the sense that I've worked with the best, you know, and I'm here. And, and one of the things I was just going to mention that over the years, in some of these shows that we go to, we meet people who went into show business, either did makeup, special effects, you know, because of films like ours, it was such a, a sort of an inspiration. 
which is kind of a cool thing. Never anticipated that as an actor when showing up. Uh, that people were, see, not that they wanted to be actors, they wanted to get in with facts, special effects, and he did. Um, so, but you start, you start going towards comedy and stuff a little bit more as you got out. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's the old story. I was, you know, just talking to one of the guys before, just about, you know, back then, this whole notion of your, you know, how are you thought of, how are you perceived in the business by the casting people? Are you, you know, a comic? Are you, not, not, you know, are you a TV guy? You know, um, and so you just try to keep them guessing is the whole idea. I mean, there have to be people in here who love Midnight Madness, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you, you know, it was, but you just don't know. I mean, you don't know how it's gonna go. I mean, I just remember, Thinking, remember when you had a plan? Hey, what a plan, you know, the plan. There's not a plan. You don't really plan that I know of your career. You know, you grab the tiger by the tail and see where it takes you. Uh, and there's the choices that you have to make and decisions. And, and you don't always know. I mean, you know, people think, oh, it's a dead sure hit. There are no dead sure hit films. I mean, you know, there are films that you think are going to be successful or you know, or just some little, little sleepers um, but you take a chance primarily because you like the people you like the part and you like the you know, general way of doing it and it's up to me and what I like to do and Griffin you did you did some really amazing films in after hours and stuff like that then was that was it easier for you to get into that stuff after American World or was that harder because you maybe you were a little bit typecast for well, I was, I was actually, it got into production around the same time, so I was producing and, and acting. And, uh, um, and After Hours was one of the movies I was producing. Um, and when uh, Martin Scorsese expressed an interest in, in doing it, we met and he said, I, I really want to do it. And it was assumed that I would be playing the lead but it was never mentioned. Uh, like Marty never said, "Oh man, you're going to be so amazing." And I kept thinking he's going to give it to De Niro any second. Um, but but uh, I you know I found out later he thought he took the role because I would uh, he took the, uh, the script and that I was in it uh, was an enhancement and a, a, an incentive because of what he saw in Werewolf. Um, he just knew I was right for that that part. And Michael, you you have a great distinction because you are in two incredibly beloved films now. And, and you know, I mean, when American Werewolf came out, you know, it, it, it has built this cult that has continued to maintain. And of course, you, I guess you kind of knew what you were going into with Star Wars. I mean, because Star Wars was so huge. Well, I didn't really think you were talking about Star Wars. Uh, I'm talking okay. about I interviewed for something called uh, Blue Velvet, yeah. and um, uh, Richard Baumgart said, and the reason I, th I, I did that was because of, um, they were looking for actors who were relaxed in prosthetics, as they said. I mean, my prosthetics in the way one that way, like a red face, look like you not really, you know, I'm, first time I saw you in full makeup, I thought, God, how can you possibly stand that? <laughs> uh, little did I know, you know, nine months later. Um, so that's why they called me in. One of the reasons they called me in, and he explained very vaguely about this part of an alien in a science fiction film. And I said, uh, he, he actually asked me if, if I would do it in the interview, there and then, which had never happened. And I said, uh, I don't know. I was quite busy at the time. And he then went at me. So eventually he said, come on, it'll be fun. It's you know, five weeks work. It'll be a laugh. It's a good part. He goes to his funny language. Yeah, 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 come on, do it. He said, well, he said, okay, next I'll tell you it's the next Star Wars film. And I go, oh, <laughs> And he also said, he said, listen, you mean, listen, you mustn't tell anybody at all that you're going to be in the next Star Wars movie. Really tell no one, okay? I said, sure. So I went straight home and told the kids. <laughs> <laughs> I said, don't tell. <laughs> so it was linked, it was actually linked. I did a film after that called uh, The Keep, another horror film. Great film. I was riding a motorcycle, I, you know, I was 
It seemed at that time I thought, I'm on, on my way to becoming the poor man's Boris Conroy. <laughs> <laughs> then the, the, the British Film Ministry went into one of his uh, periodic processions and it was like 150 films were cancelled because of the tax change. So that was it, that was the end of my brief film career. You know. And we and obviously we had the example of it today, but what's what are some of the greatest, the best things that people have said to you about America World as far as how it inspired them or how it changed their lives? Uh, uh, like, do, they, yeah. do they come and talk to you about it? I mean, I'm sure generally, they, yeah. yeah. People, uh, people generally tell me it scared them. You know, it scared them. You know, out of, out of me. It was the first movie. I, how many people I've met that the first horror film they ever seen was American World in London, shown by an older sibling or a crazy parent and said, yes, yeah, sit down and watch this, you know, all under the age, you know, this was back when ratings were, you know, rated R meant under 17, you're not going to be able to get in the theater, and this was way before DVDs even came out, you know, so, uh, but I, most of the generation that I meet are people who haven't seen it on a big screen, you know, they've just got it on the DVD, it's on the 4K version, which is really cool, but I say, you know, they do show 4K on big screens, and so if you get a chance sometime, do that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and that's, I am relatively new <coughs> to, to, uh, to coming to uh, these, these shows, and, you know, the movie was made a long time ago, and uh, what I really like about it is how much the film means to, to the viewers who see it, like, really, like, I'm just told it's my first horror film, and I remember exactly where it was, it was a moment I had with my parents or with my older brother or my older sister, and I've seen it so many times. But you know, we you know, I you kind of forget, you know, and then you come back here and you go, Wow, um, I'm so proud to be a part of this. Um, and the, the love for the movie and for our performances, it's 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 just really heartwarming every time I come here. Um the thing I missed here is people saying it's a great movie. It was a great movie. I mean, what I've had over the years is funny working on something, but it's happened to me on stage and television doing other films. Some of these events you come up to me and said, You were in an American movie one of you. You played the guy who killed the two. I said, Yeah. And they always say, Great movie, I love that. I love that. And I got up about two years ago, um, the BFI British <coughs> Film Institute decided to celebrate a young director who's now in front of me. Um, he was a comedy director and um, he was invited to the BFI and uh, there was a kind of celebration and lots of little funny things going on. The place was packed, people who loved his films and he was asked which film you, you like us to show, which is your favourite film when you pick the back of the movie. So David Schofield, who plays this little country bumpkin, starts walking with a brother and then down. And I got asked to go up there on stage and do a kind of double act. And then they showed the film, and this audience, this British Film Institute audience, just sat in a rap. All the laughs, still getting all the laughs, still getting all that, you know, you know, and at the end, it just got this five minute round of applause. Because a lot of these people had seen the film when they were, they were young, and it, it, was, you know, it was a kind of great evening out of British families, uh, and seeing it on the big screen again. Last question here. So I saw it on the big screen and my date was blushing. <laughs> it was, was your date in the film? No. <laughs> my date was not in the film, but my date was blushing next to me, going, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to do this. <laughs> so that, that was my experience the first time I saw it. I saw it on the big screen. So. And he's here today. <laughs> say this to you guys since I just asked that question. I was uh, 11 years old when the American World in London came out and I can recall, you know, HBO in the old days, they'd send you this little book in the mail every month that had what was coming on that month. So I would go through there with a highlighter and I would pick out stuff. And I wasn't allowed to watch R-rated stuff, but I saw that American Werewolf was on at like 10 p.m. And I knew my parents would go to sleep about nine. So I was supposed to be in bed at nine too. So I waited until they went to sleep and then I snuck down to the living room and I got that movie on and I was just entranced. You know, I, I grew up as a big fan of classic horror 
you know, the universal monsters and all of that kind of stuff. And when I saw this film, I was like, wow. Even at 11 years old, I was like, wow, this is something completely new and completely different. And I'm very honored that I was able to talk to you guys today about it. And I want to thank all of you for coming. And let's give them a great round. <laughs> Thank you.